Um, I've stood in front of audiences so many times over the last 20 years, justifying the present and perhaps warning about the future of theatre, that it's good to be talking about this subject at a moment when British theatre appears to be bursting with rude health. Of course, the theatre's apologists, among which I'm proud to count myself, are sometimes its worst enemies. We're inclined to nod when friendly Americans tell us how great English theatre is, and American college students, who I've met one or two of in the last week, are inclined sometimes to treat theatre as a substitute for religion. And they would have us believe that theatre is to England what spaghetti is to Italy, an ever-present <laughs> national institution. Of course, this is untrue. Spaghetti was invented in 1888. <laughs> I have no idea what the Italians did before that. <laughs> and far from the being a golden thread which stretches in an unbroken line back to Shakespeare, the modern history of theatre is a pretty spotty one. There have really only been four periods in modern English history when the theatre has been a viable force and has fulfilled its function of holding the mirror up to nature. Shakespeare and the Jacobeans from the late 1590s until the theatres were shut in 1641 is clearly one period, and the period we call Restoration, which begins in fact 15 years after the Restoration in 1675 and which goes through to 1710 with some 35 years of uh, enormous fertility. The English response to Chekhov and the Scandinavians, which includes Wilde and Granville Barker, is a period at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. And finally, the fourth is the modern period, which dates from George Devine, Joan Littlewood, and the establishment of the Arts Council uh, after the war and began in 1956. The paradox that theatre is caught in is that in order to, to succeed, it has to please, but that in order to be pertinent, it has to provoke. Art is by definition instructive, a word that we're increasingly alarmed by, and entertainment is by definition reassuring. Balancing this equation is the work that the theatre has to do on a nightly basis. Waiting for Godot, for example, contains uh, some fairly bleak nihilist philosophy. But it also has two tramps sniffing each other's socks, the basic stuff of music hall. The dilemma is that if theatre becomes too provocative, it is censored, and if it becomes too bland, it is quite rightly dismissed. But whether it's up or down, the theatre has never been much loved by the establishment in England, perhaps because it is the most public and the most outspoken of the art forms. If the American president were to visit, he'd be taken to the opera or the ballet. In fact, uh, Hillary Clinton and Sherry Blair, when they were here last summer, did attend one act of Henry V at the Globe. <laughs> but that was because it provided a terrific photo opportunity. <laughs> And that just about says it all. But if Mitterrand came, he'd be taken to the ballet. Uh, whereas in Dublin, Mary Robinson would invariably take visiting dignitaries to the best new play in town. Cynics might point out that this is because there's a certain shortage of ballet and opera in Dublin. <laughs> but I prefer to think that the Irish president knew that playwrights were the crowning glory of Irish culture. But perhaps it's also because there is a spirited interchange in a small country between artists and politicians. Uh, I was once witness to a telephone conversation between an Australian friend and colleague who was uh, running the Sydney Theatre Company and the then Prime Minister, Paul Keating. I could hear my friend relating that there were one or two problems, a few productions that underperformed, and that they were looking at the end of the year at a rather sizable deficit. Um, as it was recounted to me a few moments later, the Prime Minister uh, responded by saying, well, Wayne, I'm stuck up here in Canberra for the next couple of weeks, but I'll send the Minister down with his checkbook, and then we can have lunch and see if we can bail a few things out. 
the thought of Richard Eyre having a similar conversation with Mrs Thatcher... <laughs> or indeed even of Trevor Nunn having access to Tony Blair in quite the same way, belongs to the world of musical comedy. <laughs> the final judgment, however, that always shows with great accuracy uh, what we think of a culture and the value society places on culture is the icons we choose to place on our currency. Shakespeare made it briefly onto the £20 note but has now been displaced by Faraday, Whereas in France, Corneille, Racine, Molière, Voltaire, and never off the currency. In fact, and I'm going to digress here into theatre history, Charles II is probably the last establishment figure who really had a genuine love of theatre. And a look at the theatre's diminishing uh, power as a social force from 1675 to 1775 is salutary. Charles II was very much a hands-on patron of the King's company. He was a regular theatre-goer, attending sometimes three times a week. And each time he came, he paid in modern currency the equivalent of over £3,500 for the royal box. He was close to the actresses, as many of his contemporaries <laughs> observed. But he also had, at Windsor Castle, in his study, a portrait of William Pole, the clown of the king's company, and he regarded Pole with great affection. And when Nathaniel Green, the company's tragedian, hit writer's block, Charles sat up all night and sent him by special messenger the next morning two suggested plot lines. <laughs> of course, Nat Green felt obliged to follow one of them up, and this led to one of the most turgid tragedies in English <laughs> history. A kind of Hollywood story, you may feel. He also became so cross with one of the actors in the King's Company for not knowing his lines and busking the part that he imprisoned him in the tower for a week. <laughs> so hand-on patronage had its downside as well as its up. <laughs> Later in the reign, in the 1680s, the political situation became so difficult, Titus Oates, the Popish plot, Catholic succession, that he stopped going to the theatre. The two companies in London were combined. There became no imperative to put on new work. And writers who'd been accustomed to writing for the theatre uh, could no longer earn a living. Afra Ben, the first professional woman writer, whose importance Virginia Woolf acknowledges so gracefully, ended her career in poverty writing pamphlets. Early restoration, 1675, had to please the king. Later restoration had to bow to market forces and please the new bourgeoisie, which is one reason why early restoration is about sex and later restoration is about marriage. <laughs> These same uh, market forces meant that theatre managers became more and more dependent on box office takings as theatres grew bigger and bigger. In Charles's time, Drury Lane probably seated around 700 people. Successive restructuring, which involved cutting back the fore stage and the area with which the actors were wont to address the audience, made more seats. And when Garrick sold his shares in Drury Lane to Sheridan in 1776, the theatre seated 2,300. In 1791, uh, Wren's Drury Lane was knocked down, it was rebuilt, and the new theatre seated over 3,000. An ability to project obviously became essential and the English actor's obsession with voice and with technique probably dates from this time. Uh, Mrs Siddons, however, continued to speak and perform as she always had done, albeit, noted one polite contemporary critic, at a disadvantage in that she is not everywhere heard. To be so, she would strain her voice unnaturally. She does not choose to make this sacrifice and pres reserves her excellence to the near whatever she may sacrifice to the remote. <laughs> but of course, the biggest sufferers were the playwrights. Larger theatres made it harder and harder to take risks at the box office. A disconsolate goldsmith, at that time uh, an unperformed playwright, wrote, is the credit of our own age nothing? Must our own times pass away unnoticed by posterity? The theatre manager's dilemma is caught in a prologue 
that uh, Samuel Johnson wrote in which Garrick spoke before a performance of Merchant of Venice. It's a familiar uh, refrain. Hard is his lot that here by fortune placed must watch the wild vicissitudes of taste. Ah, let not censure term our fate our choice, the stage but echoes back the public voice. The drama's laws, the drama's patrons give, for we that live to please must please to live. Of course, I would differ with the doctor and say that too much pleasing is no good thing. Indeed, Garrick's determination to make the theatre respectable finally made it subservient. So you have the irony that the glory of English acting was also the demise of English writing. Any society that debates performances rather than plays is tipping the equation fatally towards entertainment. Market forces made Garrick's Drury Lane a theatre where Midsummer Night's Dream was renamed The Fairies and where <laughs> King Lear has a happy ending. Um, <laughs> Cordelia marries Edgar and uh, Lear goes off to a retirement home to play golf. <laughs> Here's Garrick on cleaning up Hamlet. He says, I've determined to rescue that noble play from all the rubbish of the fifth act. I've determined to bring it forth without the gravedigger's trick, Osric, and the fencing match. When Garrick finally retired, he said he didn't mind retirement because he was going to sit down and read the works of Shakespeare. And uh, Dr. Johnson commented, well, that is a thing you have never had time to do in your... <laughs> The other factor, of course, which emasculated 18th century theatre was censorship. Of course, theatre had always censored itself. Writers were smart enough to know that they were tolerated, but that they were being kept on a short reign. Restoration poetry abounds in four-letter words. I believe Rochester, and Germain Greer is about to publish a book on him, was a great poet whose influence on Dryden, Pope, uh, Tennyson uh, was enduring, but whose poetry... Uh, became marginalised because his robust language prevented his work from being taken seriously or indeed from being taught in schools. Theatre was cannier, no four-letter words in restoration plays. But the raw indecency of early restoration and the prolonged life of the rake as a central character led to Jeremy Collier's influential A Short History of the Immorality of the English Stage in 1698. One dreads to think what the long history would have been like. Playwrights were forced to clean up their act, and ground rules became accepted. George Farquhar lamented, we now have four acts of lechery and one of sanctimonious humbug. The tragedy of all comedy is that it must end in marriage, whereas the comedy of all tragedy is that it must end in death. But in fact, it was a series of political confrontations that led to the official establishment of censorship. The Beggar's Opera in 1729 was probably the biggest theatrical triumph of the century. But it contained many references to corruption and cronyism and the corruption and cronyism of Walpole's government. Walpole was himself at the first night and the concluding lyric went, when you censor the age, be cautious and sage, lest courtiers offended should be. If you mention vice or bribe, tis so pat to all the tribe, each cries that was levelled at me. Every eye in the house turned on Walpole uh, until the applause died down. But as the cheers subsided, it's recorded that he called out one word, encore. And his wit deflated a confrontation uh, for another ten years. But finally, Fielding in 1737 wrote a play called The Historical Register, which pokes fun at the terms of a peace treaty, now totally obscure. But it, it provoked a bill which was finally introduced by the Lord Chamberlain, which gave him powers to censor and ban the work in plays. And this lasted until 1966, and effectively emasculated the English theatre for generations. In fact, you could say that the great English novel, the great novel of social concern with Fielding himself leading the way, was founded on the grave of English theatre. A print, an early print of Hogarth's in 1724 shows the ghost of Ben Jonson rising through the trap door of Drury Lane, his hand unmistakably beneath his nightshirt so he can piss on the vulgar new stage machinery uh, which is present on stage and which the managers 
they are passionately discussing. Spectacle replaced wit and language on the English stage. The caption beneath the print says, Our programme will conclude with the hay dance performed in ye air. Note that there are no conjurers concerned. The bricks, rubbish, etc. will be real, but the ex excrements poured upon Jack Hall will be made of chewed gingerbread in order to, <laughs> in order to prevent offence. You may think chewed gingerbread would be offensive enough. <laughs> but above all, a sense of loss characterises the pervading 18th century view of theatre. Hogarth knew that a, that a theatre finally designed in order to prevent offence was indeed a small and watered-down thing scarcely worth defending. So why am I banging on about the past so much when this conference is concerned about imagining the future? Perhaps because the past contains encoded warnings which enable us to face the future forewarned. The following plays are all huge, profit-making, international successes. But what else do they have in common? Death and the Maiden, the Steward of Christendom, the Beauty Queen of Lenan, Blasted, and the Weir. The answer is that they all began their lives in the 63-seat theatre upstairs of the Royal Court, where subsidy keeps market forces at bay. The small theatres, the theatres able to take risks, must be subsidised. But by who? The King? The State? by sponsorship, by the artists themselves? I ask these questions, but there are no clear answers and the debate goes on. But let's take sponsorship, which has increased, is increasing, and in my view ought to be diminished. We're not far off a time when commercial sponsorship is going to pervade every area of our lives. The first scrum in the Five Nations uh, Rugby International between France and the luckless Ireland took place on the Nissan logo. Both teams emerged covered in red dye. The second scrum, a few moments later, was unfortunately on the Lloyd's TSB logo. So the players emerged then covered in blue. By then it looked more like a remake of Braveheart than, <laughs> than an international rugby match. Logos began in the 80s. At that point, the Royal Court had a new chairman, uh, who shall be nameless, but I'll supply his name afterwards to anybody who wants it, who uh, looked very carefully at the organisation of the theatre for two or three months and then said at a meeting, well, I now know what it is that you need. The Royal Court needs a new logo. And of course, we all thought, yes, of course, how could we possibly send out letters on this ridiculous note paper with this old logo? A new logo is exactly what we need. The trouble with sponsorship is that it always offers you considerable sums of money to do what's 14th on your list of priorities. Uh, they come to you and say, perhaps, would you like to run an international festival of plays written by primary school children? So you say... <laughs> Well, yes, I would like to do that, but in fact there are two plays by these unknown writers that we'd like to do first, and they say primary school children. We'll give you £500,000 if you do a festival of primary school children's plays. And you say, great, terrific idea, primary school children, when do we start? <coughs> Prada recently uh, decided that English plays were so hot that they would do away with catwalks and models for their spring fashion show, and instead would have an English play with English actors dressed in Prada clothes in Milan. It was a terrific success. But why do I find this invasion alarming? Because in my heart of hearts, I believe that an independent theatre is just as important as an independent judiciary. And the acid test of any sponsor is will they sponsor the unacceptable? Last week, the tragic suicide of Sarah Kane focused huge critical approbation on her small reservoir of work and her huge talent. And yet these were the same critics who unanimously condemned her play four years earlier and whose response <coughs> whipped up a storm of moral outrage. Would Blasted have attracted sponsorship? 
wood, shopping and fucking. We have to be careful. The history of moral outrage in the theatre is a history of foolishness. What do these plays have in common? Ghosts, the father, the plough and the stars, Mrs Warren's profession, the playboy of the Western world. Well, all are modern classics and all provoked moral outrage at their initial performance and riots. The history of riots in the theatre is a fascinating one. And if we're talking about morals, what about the morality of the sponsors themselves? I'm thinking particularly of one American tobacco giant uh, whose behaviour is impeccable towards the arts. They fund uh, ethnic groups, small dance groups, their dance programme, their liberality is uh, absolutely formidable. And yet this is the same group and the same giant tobacco company that have suppressed research into cancer and are currently flooding the third world with cheap cigarettes to create a new market. So what about the state? Can the state not be an impartial patron? Is the Arts Council not a hands-off body? It would be absurd to suggest that things are as bad uh, now as they were under the Tories. However, and things have undeniably improved, the core funding of the Arts Council, the lottery, A for E, have all improved things. But the trouble is that the Tories believe in the arts, but don't believe in subsidy, while the Labour Party believe in subsidy, <laughs> but don't much believe in the arts. <laughs> Their core belief is that the theatre should be a biddable pony that should jump the fences that they themselves have erected. These fences, of course, are education and access, admirable in themselves, but no more capable of creating good plays than marketing was able to in the 80s. Remember marketing? Marketing and security were the huge growth areas of the 80s. Somehow before that, we were able to get into buildings without remembering a jumble of figures and uh, uh, letters. David Blunkett's reaction to Shopping and Fucking, a play he hadn't heard or read, is indicative of Labour's puritanical feelings about theatre. He declared it would be inappropriate for the British Council to spend funds on such a play. Clearly a play with such a title is both provocative and mischievous. And yet it also happens to be a play with stern morality and wit, which shows a, how a rampant marketing economy can be damaging to the soul, a philosophy that you would think David Blunkett might have some sympathy with. So I see lip service, but as yet no great appetite on the part of the Labour Party to embrace the arts. And unlike Kinnock, Blair is not a theatre-goer. <coughs> Finally, what about the content of contemporary theatre? What state is it in? In the 80s, there was a consensual political belief that sustained the theatre community. Whether writers categorised themselves as Marxist, like Bond or Brenton, or socialist feminists like Carol Churchill or Timberlake Verton Baker, or liberal humanists like David Hare and Tom Stoppard. There was, from Akebourne to Pinter, the reassurance that everybody disliked Mrs Thatcher. <laughs> and to an extent, some of the themes of the 80s have now passed on to television in a watered-down way. Perhaps we don't need a coming-out play so badly when Brookside features its first lesbian kiss. Meanwhile, Casualty, uh, a television series I admire, catalogues on a weekly basis the effects and miseries caused by the withdrawing tide of the welfare state. And this in turn has left a new generation of writers freer to undertake a more personal exploration. The downside is that cynicism has replaced idealism, but if there's a lack of scale, there's also an absence of a predetermined approach. And it has to be said, it's been generally welcomed that writers have dropped their political baggage of the 80s and have returned to hardy perennials like uh, disintegrating relationships. In 1994, I directed Chekhov's great play, Three Sisters. In that play, Vashinin and Tuzenbach have a conversation in which they imagine the future. 
And Vershinin says, it seems to me that everything in life changes little by little. It must do. And it's happening already before our very eyes. In two or three hundred years' time, it doesn't matter how long, a new and genuinely happy life will emerge. Of course, Vashinin is not Chekhov, he's a character, but the author's own letters express a similar optimism. Chekhov was a doctor and a man of science. He wrote, medicine is my wife and the theatre is my mistress. He was a district cholera officer and was more proud that the seagull was performed at the 9th International Medical Congress in Moscow than in any other event in his life. If prophylactic medicine could eliminate cholera in a generation, then there were good reasons to be optimistic about the 20th century. As a scientist and as a humanist, Chekhov looked forward with incredible optimism. But it's hard for a young writer to feel that now about the new millennium. We yearn for the theatre to give us the 11 o'clock ending, the finale that sends us back into the world feeling a bit better about ourselves. But, as many commentators have noted, we live in a confused time. We live at the end of a century where all the great beliefs, science, Christianity, socialism, <coughs> feminism, the family, have been challenged and in part perhaps dismantled. Talented younger writers like Judy Upton, Sarah Kane, Mark Ravenhill, are working a new genre. Their observation of modern life shows dysfunctional, disturbed and disaffected fragments of urban life where political beliefs, spiritual expectation, job fulfilment and even romance are notable by their absence. Instead, there's a panic kept at bay by wit and style and by language. I've mentioned uh, shopping and fucking and it's probably a tribute to the power of language that the sign company employed to erect the play's title over the theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue declined the job on moral grounds. <laughs> Maybe those restoration writers had a, had a point about language. In fact, when the script of Shopping and Fucking arrived uh, through the front door, my daughter opened the uh, package and said with great excitement, Daddy, it's Shopping and the F play. <laughs> It was a powerful word that she recognised. I don't know why I'm telling this story to um, conference of analysts. <laughs> but I've started, so I'll finish. <laughs> a few years earlier, I'd been preparing her for bed. And um, it, I had one of those circular conversations that fathers have with their daughters. She said, Daddy, what's the French for head? So my French mastered that. That went on to, what's the French for arm? I think she was six at this time. And then finally she said, what's the French for fucking? Now, I said, well, Kitty, um, I don't quite know what that means in English. Perhaps you'd better explain what it means to me. <laughs> so she said, oh, Daddy, you know. <laughs> so I said, no, I don't know. Perhaps you'd better tell me. So she said, well, it means when you want someone to do something very fast, so you say, fucking get out. <laughs> but how is contemporary theatre doing? How is it assessed? What state is our theatre in? There is, in England, as there always has been, a drizzle of critical antipathy. Martin Amis is not the only writer recently to have concluded that theatre writing contains little literary merit. Uh, theatre's got an inferiority complex over film because it is inferior, sneered Tony Parsons in the last Late Show of 1998. While the Sunday Times can always be relied upon to balance the views of their excellent theatre critic, John Peter, with articles by... A.A. Gill or Brian Appleyard attacking the boredom, discomfort and triviality of the theatre or indeed as recently pronouncing Arthur Miller's oeuvre as entirely overrated. In fact, when articles attacking the theatre appeared in successive weeks in his own paper, John Peter 
and led a counterblast by commenting wittily, the postmodernist always knocks twice. <laughs> However, there's no doubt in my mind that British, and you have to say Irish, theatre is currently the envy of the Western world and has become, to use uh, an 80s term, a huge exportable commodity. Last Sunday's copy of the New York Times contains a discussion between three senior critics that is openly envious of the depth and variety of work currently available in London. The article is prompted by the presence or imminent arrival in New York this season of Blue Room, Blue Heart, Electra, Ashes to Ashes, Amy's View, The Weir, Via Dolorosa, The Beauty Queen of Lenan, and Closer. Here it is. And Ben Brantley says, he, he has a revisionist view of shopping and fucking. He, he, he can't call it shopping and fucking, he calls it shopping and dot, dot, dot. But he says, I don't think I'd ever like it, but I can see now what the buzz was about, because there's an energy, there's a sense of connection of the theatre in England with its audiences that we've lost. Uh, what's coming over here from England feels reinvented. It's coming out of the mind anew. They write in response to something visceral. Politics and ideas are still big themes in English plays. Uh, and he goes on about David Hare saying he's responsive, as are other English writers, to what's going on in the world around them. There is a sense of a dialogue with the audience that you don't get with American theatre now. Uh, London has a better theatre culture, a theatre culture that doesn't exist in New York. They also have a whole raft of actors who do nothing but work in the theatre, and that gives them an ability to do things that we could never match. In fact, what happens in New York is that however important the play, however grave and serious the subject, whatever it's about, it's immediately subverted by the much more important topic of will the New York Times like it. <coughs> Nor is current admiration for English theatre restricted simply to New York. And when I say English, I do mean Irish too. British writing is currently much acclaimed in Europe. And I have invitations at the moment to conferences in Brussels, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Berlin and Palermo, all to discuss the new British writing and its vigour. And it's a bitter irony that these meetings will principally, I'm sure, debate what national support structures should be put in place to encourage theatre writing. A bitter irony because at the same time, the newly streamlined Arts Council of England is moving to dismantle its own responsibility and devolve it to regional arts boards, a misguided and foolish step. However, and I'm going to conclude here, there is no doubt that the more you travel, what does he know of England who only England knows, the more I have discovered uh, how much we take our theatre for granted and what a state of health it's in. Tomorrow night, I believe you can have a more interesting, a more stimulating, a more provocative, a more varied night out at the theatre in London than you can in New York, in Paris, in Berlin, in Toronto, in Lisbon, in Melbourne, in St. Petersburg, although that's perhaps a close call, or in Wellington. That's the good news. The bad news for the immediate future is that the worth of this great national asset lies unrecognised and largely unexplored by anybody in the current government.